Hello, welcome back. I'm Dawn Balser and I'm here today on Facebook Live so that I can talk to you about gardening. That's why I'm here and I'm hoping that you're here too because I have so many topics today. First of all, I'm going to show you my sprouts from last week. If you remember, we started sprouts last week and they are up and they're going to be ready to eat in a day or two. Usually sprouts take seven to ten days, approximately eight days. So if you are thinking of growing sprouts, I'm going to show you what's happening. Secondly, I'm going to talk about, well, this Globe and Mail article. I think all gardeners know everything about that. And then I'm going to get back into, delve a little more into soil. So I've got a couple books to show you here that I haven't shown you before. So my soil tests are in, and that's probably what I'll start with. If you're following along in your gardener's journal, you're going to have to track what you're doing and when you're doing it. And I love that. I love looking back and I love seeing what I've been doing. So I noticed that in early January this year, what day was it? January 5th. So that was pretty early in the new year. I sent out my soil test for the south bed of my greenhouse. Now, if any of you are growing in a greenhouse, you know that you can do that, right? You can dig soil now, probably anywhere else, like on the prairies, you're not going to be digging soil right now. You are just going to have it under snow. Now, I can hear some noise in the background. So, hey, Sean's here. Sean, I'm going to be right back. i got to close the door. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. We have a very unusual thing happening today. We have not had a house cleaner ever. And my husband insists that we can do all our own cleaning. And today, for the first time in, I'd say six months, he's picked up a vacuum and he's vacuuming. So, of course, it's right during face, FaceTime Live, what else, say, eh? Facebook Live. Sorry, I'm mixing up my FaceTime because that's the only way we can catch up with some of the grandkids. So, anyway, I was talking about soil testing and that I wrote that down because I did it on January 5th and I actually heard back within three days. So, that was really exciting. So, people like Sean, who's here today, thank you, Sean have greenhouses if you have a greenhouse you probably have soil in your greenhouse and i'm just going to talk about one thing today that oh no i left my cups i brought down these really great cups but they're sitting up by my kettle where i was boiling myself some water to have a cup of tea during our uh, facebook live and they are still up there because i want to talk about cat ion exchange capacity that seems like a huge thing cat ions or the cation exchange capacity is the ability of your soil to grab onto things. So if you think of static electricity and a balloon stuck to your head, that's a temporary charge where the positives and the negatives are just kind of hanging on. That balloon is not going to hang on your head for the rest of the day. It's going to fall off after a bit. So a cation exchange capacity is a very light ability to measure how much sticking power your soils have. So usually if it's a clay soil, it's a very big mug. And I brought, I had a big mug, which I forgot to bring down, a very big mug because the capacity is very big. And if you have a little demitasse, it's a smaller capacity. So you can, still they can be empty of minerals at any time, but the one soil, the clay soil, has a bigger capacity than a tiny demitasse. Unless, and this is what I did, unless you add a lot of organic matter because organic matter can boost that cation exchange capacity and oh <laughs> sean's saying feel free to run and get a cup of water well anyway i have to say that when i got my soil tests back sean have you checked tell me if you've checked your um your soil have you done your soil test in your in your greenhouse i'm just curious because i did mine on january 5th that's something i wrote down and I just want to show you, I think you can see it pretty well here. If I show you in that one bed, which was in 2016. In 2016, this is how my soil test looks. So look at these really low areas. That's not so good. 2019, January 5th, I wrote it down. I, um, I got... A lot better results see how high most of these are and even the ones that are low are still in the optimum range so that's really good news and uh, the other thing that we were talking about earlier was cation exchange capacity 
I used to have a cation exchange capacity, a very tiny cup, that little demi tasse. They used to have 10. And now my soils have 31.8. So this is not a big deal, but if you're wondering why your gardens aren't growing to their very, very best, then you have to think about boosting your cation exchange capacity. And there's so many ways to do that. I don't know if we're going to delve into that. I want to make sure to say hi to Elizabeth. Thank you, Liz, for joining us today. So much fun. I wonder, uh, wonder what you're up to. You have mostly an outside garden, so you're probably not doing too much. But I'm talking about uh, soils today and I had some soil tests done so I was very excited to report in that my soils are so much better this year than they were in 2016 so every year this is three years now that I've had the greenhouse that I've been testing soil in the greenhouse and it's not something you have to do every year but I know Liz has had trouble with her soil so Liz if you don't watch out I'm gonna come over there and I'm gonna test that soil for you and send it out I think that would be a very fun thing to do actually I think you'd be surprised so we were talking about the cation exchange capacity it's just the ability of your soil to hold on to nutrients so if you have a very low ability if you're just a 10 pound weakling which really well, yes I am but if you're if you have a very low ability a small demi tasse you're not going to hold as much um, nutrient so then it's going to run out quicker in the season so that's all we're really saying today I'm not going to go through the whole soil test but if people are interested in getting soil tests I've been sending my note to um, the plant science lab so just email me or check on my web page I actually have my web page linked at the top it's DonnaBalzer.com. And if you look at DonnaBalzer.com, you can contact me through the webpage and for sure make sure to go in and sign up so that you can get my free organic tips, my top eight organic tips. If you want to do a little more reading about soils before you have time to get a soil test because maybe you're living on the prairies and you're just outdoor gardening, you're not in a greenhouse, if that's the case, you might want to do some more reading. And this is just a standby book that I just love, The Intelligent Gardener. Well, look at all the pages I've got marked here. The Intelligent Gardener by Steve Solomon is an amazingly good book. And if you haven't read it and want to know more about soils, very fun. And this is a newer one that I've just read called Advancing Biological Farming. It's from Acres, so you have to order it online, acres.com. And it's pretty good. It's in some ways better than the intelligent gardener not as detailed which is a bit of a ha handicap but in some ways it's better it just talks about the the way we can improve our soils without getting too complicated oh sean has a test kit now i the reason i don't like the test kits i should have shown you that uh sean the reason i don't like them is because in the greenhouse especially we're adding a lot of micronutrients so we don't really care what the nitrogen the phosphorus well we sort of care what nitrogen phosphorus and potassium are npk but it's more important actually to know what all those little micronutrients are so the basic soil tests that you can just pick up aren't going to tell you that you really have to not every year but maybe once in a while just take uh, several samples in your greenhouse blend them all together and um, put that in. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about soils today. And Sean's got a question. She says, what made you decide to use the chicken manure instead of other manure? Well, that's a good question. Because of this book, Advancing Biological Farming, I have usually used horse manure because when I've done tests on my um, soil, especially when I've done biology tests, I found that anytime I've used horse manure, I have really good numbers of nematodes, and I was always very excited about that. But in advancing biological farming, Gary Zimmer reminds us that a chicken manure is more like a green manure. It's more like adding green steer compost, whereas um, a pig or even, um, actually pig manure is sometimes in that same category, but a horse or a cow manure is more like brown. So if you're adding up how many greens and how many browns you're putting into your compost, during the winter we are adding quite a few greens, but there's still a lot of, a lot of leaves that I'm adding, and those leaves are browns. So a chicken manure source, if you can find a fresh chicken manure, not a composted bagged chicken manure, will give you that green component so you get the extra nitrogen. And I'm trying to reawaken my compost. I'm trying to actually, in my greenhouse, to start a good size compost so that I can have heat given off by the compost right in my greenhouse. So that's why Sean was wondering why I'm using chicken manure. I'm using it because of that. So that is why. So thank you for asking, 
Sean's been Sean's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. She follows along. She um, she is always quick to comment, and I really appreciate that, Sean. That's really great. So chicken manure is more like adding a green, where as um, whereas horse manure is more like a brown. And part of that is because you just can't buy a straight up uh, manure anymore because of horses in a barn or if a cow was kept in a feedlot, they usually have been adding uh, wood chips or wood shavings and that's really adding a heavy brown component. But also we know that the, um, we know that the um, actual nitrogen that's available has been largely leached out. So fresh chicken manure, they were just cleaning out the barn. I found out something really interesting, 2019, all chicken feed is turning to be, it's all going to have no antibiotics in it. So starting in 2019, this farmer was telling me he's just got his new shipment. He sells by contract. They're all open um, free range chickens. And all the feed that they're giving them, there's no antibiotics added. So that's a new rule in Canada in 2019. So I'm excited about that. Anyway, anybody else have a question? You can feel free to ask. Sean's on it. Oh, Kristen's back. Hi, Kristen. Kristen and I were tweeting earlier today. Apparently, old gardeners all have the same problems. So she's telling me that I need to try chicken manure as it's used extensively by farmers out here. Yeah, so what I did, Kristen, is I just looked on, um, I guess it was the, well, it wouldn't matter because you're not in this area, but you can look on the various farm um, Facebook sites and you can see if you can find um, someone that's got their chicken manure that they're just cleaning out their barn. That is the best time. My son raises chickens and when I looked at his chickens, I could see that there's just that fresh layer of manure just kind of on every roost and it's sort of in his little shed. I mean, he's up in, in Smithers and it's freezing cold and they do get five eggs out of five hens every day. So they're doing really, really well. But some of the commercial chicken farmers put in the dry sawdust and they spread them out the whole barn. And then the chickens are pecking through it so much that the stirring up of that um, and the combination of the manure and the, and the uh, wood shavings makes it a very light, almost blow away. If you saw my little post the other day, it's, it's really blow away. It's a very fine, dusty product. And so it's nothing like the mature um, manure that you might find. But you know that. You're a gardener. So thanks for, for mentioning that, Kristen. It is a way to add greens in the winter, which seems kind of crazy, but it is a really great way. And so what I got my chicken manure for was to add to my compost. I have three big composters that are going and one of them's pretty much finished and the other two are just working. And what I wanted to do was add something to give them just a little, and I added it to all three to give them just a little bit more oomph. So especially the one can finish up and the other two can just keep working because when it gets cold, they can't often keep the, the speed going on the composting. So I'm reinvigorating my compost. So, oh, that's fine. Now, my husband occasionally, just for a treat, buys me the Globe and Mail. It seems like a goofy thing to do, but I love the Globe and Mail, and I love the paper copy of the Globe and Mail. Of course, I get the Calgary Herald, I get that online, and I read it online, but I really love a piece of paper. So check out this article in Saturday's paper. Inflation rises as travel and produce offset gas prices. So in fine print, when you read down, so inflation, this is 2018 inflation, it says that Canadians paid, are you ready for it? 14.9% more for fresh vegetables and 28.1% for more air transportation. So just look, look at the vegetables, 14.9% more for fresh vegetables in 2017 or 2018. So over 2017, so 14, over 14, almost 15% was 15%, 14.9 is 15%. So more and more people are going to become interested in growing their own vegetables. When they start to read headlines like that, they're going to say, hey, I want to grow more vegetables. So I'm very excited about that headline in the Globe and Mail this weekend that I'm trying to figure out how I can use that in one of my talks this spring. My first talk is coming up in Grand Prairie. So if you live in Grand Prairie, I'm going to be up there on February 9th 
and then I'm in Victoria, and then I don't know where I am next. But I've posted them all on my events, on my Facebook page, and of course on my website, which is DonnaBalzer.com. So go and visit that. Now I'm sure a lot of you, I know I have been going through my catalogs, and I've actually started to receive seeds already. And the seeds I've been receiving, I'm really excited. A few weeks ago, Margo joined us and she told us her favorite carrot was called sweetness. So I ordered sweetness carrots. They're a Nantes type and they've already arrived. So that one was an easy, easy to do. But because I constantly get questions, this is another worksheet I'm working on. If you want this worksheet, it's still in its infancy. But if you want to just shoot me an email and I'll send it to you. This is my seed comparison list for 2019. So I'm not comparing every type of seed ever grown ever. But what I'm doing is I'm going through my catalogs, the ones I've received, the ones I've ordered from in the past. So even if I don't physically have a catalog, like the Baker Creek catalog is quite thick. So they don't mail it out every year, or at least I haven't received it every year, but I do order a few things from them there in the States. So I've included them. In fact, I've included, I didn't even count this up yet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different sources. And then I've compared some of the things I like to grow. So the first one is something I've never grown before. I bought these at Costco frequently. These are the, you know what I'm talking about, the naked pumpkin seeds. I'm thinking, who shelled all those pumpkin seeds? I really did not know that they were selling a variety of pumpkin that had naked seeds. So, okay, I've only been gardening for 40 years. I did not know that there was a variety of pumpkin. Maybe Kristen knew that. Kristen's a gardener too. Oh, yeah, she's saying vegetable prices are crazy right now. $6 for a head of cauliflower. Kristen, I am so glad you brought that up because just last night I harvested my last cauliflower from my greenhouse whoops better learn to type here cauliflower C A U uh -oh. and the, the cauliflower that I harvested it was a Susanna and I've written about that before. And you've seen pictures of that when I picked my last outdoor Susanna. Um, everybody saw a picture of it on Facebook. It's a green cauliflower, really a nice one. And for some reason, I forgot I had some in my greenhouse. Uh, I had usually most of my cauliflowers were up in my big greenhouse and those were all gone before Christmas. But in my little greenhouse where I'm mostly overwintering my echeveria and I have sort of ornamental things in there, I forgot that I had also put some cauliflowers in and most of them have been removed and taken out, but I had one left and I went in last night and we had it last night. It was so amazing. So if you are not growing your own cauliflowers yet in your own greenhouse, you have to do that. Oh, Kristen's just saying she's never heard of the naked seeds. Okay. I was still just answering a question about the cauliflower, which I agree with. So the naked seed pumpkins, I'm so glad I'm not the only one that hadn't heard about that. This year, when I was looking through my catalogs, all of the different catalogs were offering naked seed pumpkins. And the most common one offered was called naked bear pumpkin. So here's how the prices compared for the seeds. $3.95 for 10 seeds from TNT Seeds. $4.45 for 10 seeds at William Dam. $4.99 at West Coast. Okay, I can go on because I've got five sources here. But what I'm trying to say to you is that this plant I've never grown before. I have no idea what it is. It was ranging in price from $3.95 to $5.25 for the same amount of seeds. So you have to be really careful. Even if you have a favorite catalog that you love. Now it's craziness. It's like driving 100 miles to save two cents on gas. That is not a good idea. And it's not a good idea to order one seed packet from each catalog. That is not a good idea. But it's a good idea to kind of look at all your catalogs. And that's why I'm assembling this little mini list. And on this list, I'm including one thing new, which is the Naked Seed Pumpkins something old which is the juliet tomatoes those are my favorite they're not that old but i've been growing them for about five years they're my favorite one for paste tomatoes they're very i just actually last week i think i posted a picture a couple days ago ate my last juliet tomatoes which is incredible it's Ju january 20th right now 
Also Tierra cabbage, which is an incredibly early, they call it lettage. It's like a really crispy, almost like a leaf lettuce or almost like a head lettuce. It's a beautiful, lo lovely cabbage. So I included that as a comparison. Now get a load of this, Tierra cabbage, the cheapest place I could find it was William Dam Seeds. The most expensive, and it was $2.95. The most expensive was Johnny's for $4.35. And that is American, $4.35. That must be 100 bucks. Anyway, I'm just saying that if you want to see uh, what I've got and what I'm growing and some of the things I'm looking at ordering, for instance, uh, William Dam has jade organic beans. These are just a lovely, crisp bush bean that's green, a, ni a nice round bean, $2.45 for 125 seeds at William Dam. Well, you can't go wrong. The next place, the only other place I could find jade beans was Johnny's, and that was $4.55. That's American. So go figure. You have to get right on it if you are looking. So I'm just writing up this list now, and it's ready to email out. I'm attempting to figure out the technology I I don't know. I'd like to turn it into a post. And so look for it on my posts. But I don't know. In the meantime, if you want what I've got done so far, it's just a comparison of things I want to grow and things I have grown. So I think that that's really neat. Okay. Donna's here. Hi, Donna. Not the same Donna as me. She's got the, the younger Donna spelling. What is the best method to test seed viability with a self-harvested crop? I have, for example, a massive blue Hubbard that I harvested. Oh, I'm so glad Donna brought up Blue Hubbard squash. If you didn't know, Blue Hubbard is a squash and she harvested, Donna harvested her own seeds last week or last year. So Donna, um, she also mentions, I like to grow, but I am unsure of what they were cross pollinated with, or even if the seeds will sprout. A couple weeks ago on the Facebook Live, we actually talked about that. We talked about how to do testing. And I just use a piece of paper towel and I count out 10 seeds. So get an ordinary piece of paper towel, put 10 seeds on it, moisten it, moisten that paper towel first, lay out the seeds evenly, roll up the paper towel, put it in a Ziploc bag, and then just leave it in a warm spot. So I like to leave it in maybe on top of my grow lights because the just the heat from the lights keeps it warm or maybe on top of your fridge so 10 seeds the reason you count out 10 seeds is because then you can guess at your percentage germination so if you count out 10 seeds and i did this i had nine of my sesame seeds germinate nine out of ten so that's a 90 percent ratio i had only six of my five-year-old lettuce seeds okay they were five years old uh, but still, I had six. So what that tells you is if you'll be able to, and that's 60%. So it means I'd have to seed those a little heavier in the garden or the sesame seeds. And basically that's what they came with last year was that same um, amount of sprouting. But the trouble is you're looking at blue hubbards. And if those blue hubbards are special and you did not cover them when they started to flower and then hand pollinate all of your blue hubbards yourself, then the seeds that are in the blue hubbards, well, squash are very promiscuous. We've talked about this before, but the bees go from plant to plant. I've read in the um, Baker, 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 I think it's just called Baker, Baker Creek catalog. I've read in the Baker Creek catalog that you have to keep them isolated by five kilometers. So if you're in the city, for sure, there's somebody with a zucchini or another type of Hubbard squash or another type of squash that's going to pollinate it. So a pretty good chance you are not going to be able to use those seeds, or at least if you do use them, you're probably not going to get blue Hubbards. They're not going to be exactly the same, even though a lot of people think if they start with an open pollinated seed, and that's a seed that's um, already known to be self-producing the way it was uh, and coming back true, it won't come back true if you've had a bee come in from your neighbors and bring in some pollen from, say, a Walton butternut squash, because it's still a winter squash, but when you put it on your Blue Hubbard winter squash, it's going to change the seeds. So the seeds will actually represent the combination of the mother and the father. And as they grow up, you just don't know what you're going to get. So I think you're out of luck on that. Um, thanks for asking that question, but I think you're out of luck. I don't think, um, you know, I honestly don't think I would trust those seeds. Um, at least I wouldn't trust them to come true. 
But you know what? You can still try the germination test. You can still put the 10 seeds out on your paper towel, roll them up and put them into a Ziploc on that warm spot. And But I honestly don't think that they will come true and give you the same plant. Unless you're on a farm at least five kilometers away from where the next person was growing, or at least you, or if you don't have any bees at all in your garden and you've done all your own pollinating. So I don't think they will come true and you will get um, get a potluck squash. And honestly, sometimes you get really great potluck squashes, but um, not always, sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes you get disastrous results. So why don't you, um, maybe next year, if you want to save your own seeds, plan to cover them and do all of them hand pollinated. I think that's going to be your best bet. Well, I can't believe we've used up almost half an hour ago. I didn't ask uh, Liz if she had a question. She signed on earlier, and I don't see if she's still here, but she's um, she signed on earlier and said hello. So I hope that she's... Um, I hope she's with us. I see Dawn is here and Kristen. I said hi to Kristen. So maybe I've said hi to everyone. Oh, Debbie Henderson's here too. So that's tremendous. So thank you all for joining me. We have a couple more minutes if there's any more questions. I did have something else I wanted to show you. So last week I showed you how to seed your, your microgreens. And these are the ones that I was seeding last week. Can you remember these last week? Look how they're growing out the bottom already. So I just seeded these last week and this is a type of microgreen called uh it's a pea and it's one of my favorite types of peas and so of course it's on my list and if you haven't ever grown microgreens uh start with the oregon giant peas they are amazing <laughs> they'll come up and they're really tasty to eat they can be put into salads when i can start harvesting these now and putting them right into the salads which is nice i still have lots of kale so I'm still making quite a few salads. You've probably seen those pictures. But Oregon, I just want to give you an idea about Oregon giant peas. Another name is Oregon sugar pod too. And the different catalogs are listing them differently. But my research has said that they're the same thing. So if you're growing Oregon giant peas, you can get them for $2.15. $2.15. At William Dam Seeds. Or you can pay as much as $4.35 US at Johnny's. Isn't that incredible? So that is more than double plus the American exchange. So I just want people to really be careful and really check it out. And last week I was talking about mums seeds. They sell specific seeds for growing of your own microgreens. And one of the ones they sell for microgreens is the Oregon giant pea. And the reason I love this as, an, as a microgreen, and that's why I've got it here, the reason I love it is because when I'm growing my microgreens later in the spring, maybe March or even into April, after I've been harvesting them a bit, I'll actually go in and take clumps of those and plant them out in the garden. And I have been really successful with that. And that's why I've decided not to order any more of the generic peas. You can buy the generic microgreen peas, but instead I'm ordering from mums the specific Actually, I ordered five kilograms just a few days ago. I ordered those because I wanted to get those specific seeds so that when the time is right in the spring, I will put those directly out in the garden. It just gives me a bit of a head start, especially for all the birds, because that's about the time when all the birds are migrating north and they're looking for fat seeds like peas. So I like to have that pea plant already started, already growing, well-rooted. And I don't want to put out an unknown pea because that won't be any good. So I'm using the Oregon and I really love the Oregon giant peas. So again, if you want this list, I think we're out of time. But if you want the list, and I'm just working on that now, you can email me and I'll send it to you the way it is now. It's not all fixed up. I'm actually creating it for my course that I'm running on February 9th. So if you happen to know anyone that's in Grand Prairie and can send them a little heads up, I think there's still two or three spots left in that class. So that's what I'm creating the list for, but I'm happy to share it. And I'm so happy that everyone joined me today. It was a really fun day. We didn't have any of that crosstalk going on today. Sometimes you guys answer each other's questions, which is really fun, hard to keep track of. And sometimes, I've just read this recently, Facebook has a 20 second delay. So even after I hang up here, we might still actually have more comments coming on. Oh, well, there we go. There was just a comment pop popped up from Wayne. So Wayne has finished digging in 14 huge leaks in the garden. Now I wonder, 
Wayne, what are you going to do with 14 leeks? I would tend, because Wayne's in a warmer climate, he's in the Parksville area, I would tend to leave them in the soil until you're ready to use them because 14 dug up all at once is just a lot of leeks, but fantastic. You should post a picture here of how they looked, Wayne. That's really, really great news. So I'm going to say goodbye. It doesn't mean we're finished because what you'll see happens in this space is that people go in later and they ask different questions and then I answer them or they answer each other's questions. So we're, we're done for now, but we're not done forever. And I have also started posting these on YouTube because then you can go in on YouTube and you have a chance to rehash it. And the thing I like about YouTube, it doesn't get lost in time. I've got them all in one category under garden questions. And so if you want to go back and review, I think Donna was talking about Oregon giant peas or was it something else? So you can go back in. So I've been posting them on YouTube as well as on Facebook because they tend to get lost in the string of command with Facebook. So thanks for joining me today. If you haven't already got your gardener's gratitude journal, I just want to bring that up one more time. You have to start more marking things down when you pick up your manure, when you send out for your soil test. If you do decide to do a soil test, let me know and we'll discuss that again in a later week. And I'd love to uh, follow this conversation through. So thanks again. Talk to you soon. I'm Donna Balzer. I'm a horticulturist and you can get a hold of me on my website and please follow me on my website. That's DonnaBalzer.com. Thank you so much.